screen um, indicating that the session is being recorded. Um, I'm now going to introduce each of our three speakers in the order that they will be presenting. Lynette Tessator Lopez is the planner uh, and program manager for historic preservation at the city of Chula Vista, and she will be speaking to the newly formed Chula Vista HPC and talk about the lessons she's learned in the process of forming a commission. Tim Fry, the preservation coordinator for the city and county of San Francisco planning, will talk about the management of HPCs um, and will be sharing part of the presentation with Lynette. Wade Broadhead uh, is the planning director for the city of Florence uh, in Colorado. Um, he's going to talk about civic engagement, uh, community involvement, and diversity in historic preservation commissions. Um, I'm now going to briefly mute all the presenters. Unfortunately, this also means that the speakers will be muted along with the, uh, with, with the um, attendees. Uh, but I will, in one second, I will unmute the speakers after this has been complete. So please hold on one second. Okay, so we are now ready to begin. So, uh, Lynette, you're ready to go. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here today to speak to you about Chula Vista's experience with City and Historic Preservation Commission and managing that commission. So I don't see my presentation. So, Lynette, if you're unable to control your slides, I can take it over from here as long as you just let me know when. I don't see my presentation at all. I apologize. I thought that it would come up, but I don't see it. Oh, you don't see it at all. No, oh, there's no presentation on my screen. But, um, let's see. It says share my screen. My apologies. It was just there. <laughs> Uh, can you see it now? Uh, Lynette, what are, you, what are you looking at right now? Um, uh, forgive us for a, a brief break here. Um, I'm trying to figure out what what the issue with the is with the screen. If um, if you can't see the screen, let me know in the chat box. I can see it right now, fine. Um, and I think we have lost Lynette's sound for whatever reason. So m maybe the best um, course of action at this point is uh, to move over to Tim's presentation, and we can take it up from there and um, start from the beginning later. Uh, 
Uh, Tim, I know this is a bit out of uh, order, but um, did you want to begin from yours? Uh, Wade, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, this is really odd. Um, this has never happened before. Um, but maybe, Wade, I know this is quite a bit out of order, but would you like to begin <laughs> with your presentation? Yeah, I'd be, be happy to. Mine's not necessarily that out of order. Yeah, that's true. And you can hear me, right? I, I can hear you fine. I think everybody else can. Um, so um, I'll try to work through the sound issues with, with the others while we're figuring this out. OK. We should let everybody know that we did get on 30 minutes early and test all this, and it did work. Yeah, we've tested it twice now. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, no, it wasn't for a lack of uh, <laughs> testing to fall out. Uh, all right, all right. Start so, up then? Yeah, so I'll be silently working through the sound issues while you're get, giving your presentation. Um, all right. We're still only 15 okay, well, minutes however, in, so we still have plenty. Okay, and I'll be brief to give them a lot of time. And so, um, hello everybody. My name is Wade Broadhead. I'm the planning director for the city of Florence, Colorado. Um, it's so town of 4,000 people just south, uh, hours southwest of Colorado Springs. And um, I, I previously was the preservation staffer for City of Pueblo, Colorado, which is 100,000 people um, located about half an hour of uh, Colorado Springs, where I staffed the commission for a number of years. And now I'm actually in the process of uh, setting up my own preservation commission and becoming a CLG in a, in a small town so I can relate to uh, both sides of the story. And, well, I was asked to talk today a little bit about um, commissioner engagement and commission engagement and what the uh, Preservation Commission can do to stay in the good graces of city council as well as um, generate public support and get new people uh, to apply for the commission, which you'll hear about in the other presentations. So I'll just jump right in. And the cover slide here is, um, is our youth commissioner, which I'll talk about in a second. We're the first place in Colorado to have somebody um, kind of a youth member on our commission that's actually a, a good standing voting member of, a, of the commission and not just a, um, a recommendation. And the first thing I want to talk about was uh, NEP, National Alliance of Preservation Commissions, does a ton of training and their executive director, Paige Pollard, was supposed to be on the call, but something else came in. So I'm filling in for her today, so I want to make a quick plug for the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. We hold um, camps on demand for state preservation offices and people all over the United States. And CAMPs are Commission Assistance and Mentoring Program. And we've been doing this for the last 18 years or so. And basically, we'll send three you know, diverse voices, male, female, small town, big town, um, lawyer, <coughs> staffer, consultant, all sorts of different people. Three people descend upon a location and provide uh, training for preservation commissions. And it's especially geared for brand new commissions. So, Everybody on this call who is just forming a commission or has got new commissioners, um, to be a certified local government, you must always need a training um, aspect to your new commissioners. And so the National Alliance of Preservation can provide that. I just wanted to follow up by saying that we also do a lot of other things now. We can do speakers bureaus. So if you need somebody to come in and talk about a special topic, we can help match you to that. Um, and we have new offerings now with, um, with MOD in mid-century, low income. And we can also do a mock preservation commission hearing, which we just did a couple of months ago. That was pretty fun. We can actually have new commissioners walk through a, a commission with a little bit of humor and kind of figure out what, what to do and not to do. But as part of all these trainings, we always do ethics, um, meeting procedures, and law. So I think those are the things that really um, stick with a lot of commissioners who are kind of blown away by this stuff. So. That's my commercial for uh, NAPC, and I'll jump into my presentation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about diversity in terms in all all facets and formats, and a little bit about um, youth, especially since we've had a success story. I think sometimes it's just fun to hear, um, you know, successes and failures, and what people tried and what worked and didn't work, and how they did it. So I was going to kind of be the um, 
<coughs> the anecdotal story at the end, but we'll start off with the anecdotal story. And so a lot of this is mated by the Park Service and they in reservation planning and goals. Um, the number two is to really is their whole point of giving you the money to do the certified local government program is to increase opportunities for uh, broad-based and diverse public participation. And, and they're serious. They want you to be engaging your citizens and figure out what type of preservation they want to do. And they want you to have a diverse audience. And they want you, I think, to have diverse um, preservation commissioning. Um, really quickly, this, the commission that I was staffing had sub, seven members. It was relatively recent in terms of uh, Colorado commissions, and it was uh, created in 2003. Um, about 250 protected resources, one big um, commercial district that downtown that took up about 100 of those that actually had a zoning aspect to it, too. Um, our community is unique. It's south of Colorado Springs. It's kind of in the um, Hispanic culture area. It's more like northern New Mexico than Colorado. We have a 50% Hispanic population. That's um, older generation Hispanic population. It was one of our goals was kind of reach out. Um, and make sure that we were doing activities and kind of aligned with half of our population. We're um, a kind of unique uh, neighborhood that kind of self-identify more like a Chicago or a Boston than um, a Denver or some other kind of western cities. Um, we still have an active steel mill town, and we had um, not that many cases. We'd have a couple cases every month, but we had a lot of projects, and so we used preservation projects funded by the Certified Local Government Grant Program to kind of build support and get different people interested. And just in terms of um, management, we would always have an annual retreat. We'd, we would try to do a, a yearly report to the city council. It was required by council, but they wouldn't always take us. So we had to um, get creative with that. And during our retreats, we'd sometimes try to schedule tours. You know, and with the Sunshine Laws, we'd always try to, you know, these would always be, um, you know, notice to the public and to the public could attend these meetings as well. I talk about something unique. I don't know if California has done this yet, but the National Park Service is funding uh, a bunch of these and Colorado spearheaded uh, youth summits. And I don't know if there's one coming to California, but I hope so. And if not, you can kind of copy some of this model. And it's really treating like kids like they're consultants. And they basically descend upon in, into a region. And this started for about seven or eight years in Colorado. And they treat this region um, as a working kind of historic landscape. And they would work with educators. And they would work with the students. And they would go see you know real working live ranches. They would go um, make adobe and help somebody repair something and do a public civic project. And they'd always have a, a wrap-up meeting. And the students would then um, present to the governor's office, state senators, city council, and, and make recommendations about how places can engage youth as well as just do better with preservation and kind of working landscapes. They're really uh, a neat thing that I kind of got dragged into. But so, um, last year, two years ago, it was the first time that they've been doing a lot of things in public lands. So that's where they got the money. And I suggested that we do some real kind of urban preservation like most commissions are dealing with. And we decided to schedule a, a, a mock commission hearing at the end of a long day of touring our neighborhoods. And so it was the first time the kids have ever gotten to see a preservation commission commission in action. And so um, part of this was that we went to um, a CLG-funded uh, mid-century Slovenian neighborhood. We were doing a, a mid-century project um, that had to do a lot with memoirs and engaging the neighborhood and kind of talking to people about their cultural traditions. Our town's kind of mi um, mixed up between um, Hispanic immigrants as well as Slovenian and Italian with a little bit of Irish and some other things thrown in. But the Slovenians were one of the largest groups. And they're still kind of a living, active, historic neighborhood there. And um, we also, the kids then had lunch, and they had Slovenian food, listened to Slovenian music. And the fun, best part was that they raced kibasa. It was a kind of a newer cultural thing they had there. And we played a lot of games that they played in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, washers, um, things you probably associated more with Brooklyn or New York or something like that. They had played all these kind of games in the steel mill working town. And kids were learning about history, and they had different stops. And uh, they were listening about how historic preservation was dealt with all sorts of issues here. Um, one of the, the most thing that relates to this presentation the best was that we decided to have a, a mock preservation commission hearing. And some of the teachers weren't quite sure whether this would work or not. So we kind of came up with some um, kind of comical cases, but very serious cases about you know when our historic district would somebody want to add solar power looked at our regulations, looked at some other state regulations, and then we also looked at uh, an addition to a historic house. And we had state people from the state be the applicants. And then all the students were invited to come up and speak uh, um, for or against the applications. And the range um, and the, the depth of the comments the students had were just amazing. Sometimes they don't look like they're paying attention. They did a great job. 
And uh, they, you know, some of the students, you know, they weren't 100% unanimous for solar or the addition that was. There were some for and against. But it was, you know, it's really funny and it was a really good time. The kids related to it. You know, these are kids who have to apply to be in this program. Not all of them are kind of, um, you know, wealthy white kids. There's a diverse group of students in this program, but they do have to um, apply to be in this program. And so the result of that was at the end of the meeting, we had a student with, um, from Pueblo. These students are from all over Colorado. One of the students from Pueblo asked if she could be on the Preservation Commission. I thought that was really sweet, and she was just humoring me and, and being nice, but she was honest. And so she applied once we had her next opening. And uh, it confused her city clerk, which she put, didn't know what to do. Um, she was a 17-year-old, and uh, she wasn't sure. And she went through our ordinances and could not find anything against her being on the Preservation Commission. And uh, there wasn't a lot of competition for that round, so she was appointed. And then the city council person, um, you know, read a resolution or whatever it was to appoint her. You know, it was a standing ovation from city council. So that was a nice um, feather in her cap, as well as good press for preservation commission. So here's a picture of Winter, and so she lives in the city of Pueblo, and now has been on the commission for about a year. Um, just also, the Youth Summit kids were also. Um, Another one tried to get in the commission right after this. So we were first, and then in Broomfield, Colorado, as a pres preservation commission, and they had a much different story. And so when a, a youth member applied for one of their openings, uh, the same thing happened. The city government didn't know what to do. They actually had an ordinance saying that somebody had to be at least be 18 or 21 to be on one of their boards or commissions. But they didn't know what to do because the student was so well dressed and so well spoken that most of the people wanted to vote for <laughs> the student over some of the adults that applied. And so it was kind of a neat process. The student was invited to come in and help work on an ordinance that would allow youth, um, and the, I'm not sure if it was a voting or not voting member to all boards except for the liquor board and any other board that had to do with things that were 21. So engaging youth actually helped get into a committee that helped um, draw up a new ordinance. And now that person has been appointed as a non-voting member to the Preservation Commission there. And then finally, I just want to talk briefly about re, um, expanding the reach of your commission. Pueblo had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, utility with working the certified local government grants program. And you, know, you don't have to fund these things. You can, but uh, doing projects that engage kind of uh, neighborhood areas, and that way everybody was engaged. I think sometimes we didn't want to just do a Hispanic context or just a, a Slovenian context first. We wanted to do something that everybody was invited. So we did neighborhood-based things. And so that ended up working really well. And so we were working with diverse groups. Um, we were looking for community leaders, and we are looking for power players, which then automatically gives you diverse advocates on city council. And uh, to talk about something I think the other speakers are going to talk about, you know, the Preservation Commission, once we got started going and started doing these projects and getting press, we would have more people apply for our openings than any of the other boards and commissions. And so city council actually looked favorably on us because they would actually have a choice, and they enjoyed making a choice for um, the boards and commissions. When the Zoning Board, Planning and Zoning Commission, we would really have to beat the bushes to get anybody to apply. And uh, just want to talk about one of our projects really briefly. We um, have the East Pueblo. It's about 14,000 people, the size of you know, bigger this, than the city that I'm in. And it's a, a neighborhood, older neighborhood, um, kind of deteriorating kind of urban um, kind of rust belt issues where pe a lot of people have moved out. And uh, we had one Hispanic um, commissioner who ran the museum. And we were going to vote on which neighborhood to study. And she kind of stood up and said, no, we really need to study this neighborhood. There's a lot of stories there. There's a lot of new immigrants there. Um, and it's just a really rich history. And so she um, studied the votes. And we decided to vote for a, a CLG grant to study this area. And we got, the, we got it. And uh, we started engaging this neighborhood, which was really put together. And again, the east side has you know, great historic housing. And some of it's in this condition, and some of it's in great condition. But the things are just kind of slipping. So we thought we, preservation can maybe help tell the story and get people excited. Then we decided through another grant from the American Institute of Architects, we had a small $300 grant to commission a local artist to do some logos for our project. And this neighborhood is predominantly 80% Hispanic now. There's a long tradition of mural from the um, 50s and 60s and 70s and a lot of the La Raza activism that was going on in public spaces. And so we actually you know, we made the um, logo tie into the history. And then you know, we went one step farther. We made them into shirts. And so the committees that were working in the neighborhood that was um, tied in with preservation got copies of these shirts that had copies of these logos. And um, the city council people and the community leaders were really excited that we were doing something different. Um, and so to wrap it up, basically, 
we in really strongly engaged the Eastside Hispanic residents and their leaders were uh, aware of historic preservation. One of the best things I thought was um, when this lady here, Eva Montoya, she, she was going to run for the Preservation Commission, decided to just skip it and run for city council and got elected easily. She became a really big advocate for historic preservation. I remember somebody came in and wanted to reuse a, a vacant church, and she said, you know, you, you can't. And here's a you know a city council person who's talking about historic integrity based on you know all the education she'd gotten from these uh, community-based projects that were spearheaded by staff and the preservation commission. So I will finish up and um, answer any questions I think at the end, and I could book through the chat box as well. So thank you guys very much. Hi. Thank you very much, Wade. Uh, we're going to do a quick sound check. Just want to hear if either Lynette or Tim is is working now. This is Tim. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud yep. and clear. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Uh, Lynette? This is Lynette. Can you hear me? Yep. And can you see the screen? Yeah. <laughs> Great. I'm going to pull up your screen right now, Lynette. I want to be sure you can see it. Thank you so much. My apologies, everyone. I'm not exactly sure what happened there. We did have a couple of dry runs on this, and it worked perfectly. So. Okay, so can you see it? Yes. Can everyone okay, hear Okay, perfect. Okay, yes. Great. So as I mentioned today, I'm going to uh, speak about our recently seated Historic Preservation Commission as well as um, managing that commission. So our Historic Preservation Commission was seated in 2012. It's a seven-member commission. Our city charter requires that all of our commissioners are registered to vote in the city of Chula Vista. Our members' commissions required to have four members. I will ask you to speak louder, Lynette, if you can. Sure. So our commission has a requirement that at least four of the members are considered to be experts in the field of historic preservation. And that's defined in our municipal code, and it aligns with the Secretary of Interior's professional qualification standards. Um, so they have to have an education or background in historic preservation or a related field. And four of our members are required to meet that criteria. One member is to be a licensed realtor. Um, we have a strong realtor here in the city of Chula Vista. They were very involved in our historic preservation ordinance when we were writing that ordinance and our historic preservation program when we were developing the program. So when we brought the item forward to city council, our mayor made the motion and our council concurred that one member would be required to be a licensed realtor. All members must have an interest, competence, or knowledge in historic preservation. So that is the realtor as well needs to have that interest, competence, or knowledge in the field of historic preservation. And then, uh, I know you're probably also dialed into a phone, right? Um, I'm not anymore because there was some oh, okay. conflict between the two. Can you hear me? Yeah, some people are having problems hearing you. So if your volume, microphone volume is low or if... Um, yeah, There's a drop-down button at the top of your screen. Sure, my apologies. I had lowered the volume, so let's see if that works. So is that better? Much better, thank you. Oh, yeah. My apologies again. Um, our Historic Preservation Commission is a mayoral appointment with council con concurrence is required. Our HPC, as we refer to it here in the city, is equivalent to our planning commission. So they are a quasi-judicial commission. They hold public hearings. They are required to meet findings of fact on certain items, so designation and approval of certificate of appropriateness. They have final approval authority in most matters. Uh, their actions are appealable to our city council and they meet twice per month on the opposite Wednesdays of our planning commission. They 
The seating of our first Historic Preservation Commission in Chula Vista required that we educated the decision makers. So management, city administration, our council, other commissions, the public, as the need for having a qualified commission over historic preservation and ultimately showing them that that results in less time and less money for our applicants and results in more protection of our valuable historical resources here in the city. Qualified candidates, finding candidates to sit on commissions can be a challenge. Uh, finding candidates to sit on a specialty commission such as historic preservation, especially when you have requirements of four experts, one realtor, all that live within the city of Chula Vista, that have an interest, competence, or knowledge in historic preservation, and are willing to sit on a commission. So that can be quite a challenge. What we've found helps us to find qualified candidates is to do advertising in our local paper, to work with our communications department on doing those email blasts out to those local stakeholder groups, utilizing professional organizations such as APA and AEA, and doing public outreach of social media and email blasts to our always contact list, people who are typically involved in the city on other matters. We have a customized application for our Historic Preservation Commission that differs from our standard city commission application, which is more of a checkbox type of form. But our customized application for our Historic Preservation Commission requires that the applicant actually write out what their interest, competence, and knowledge is in historic preservation and that they provide a resume to demonstrate that experience and that background in historic preservation or a related field. Candidate selection, a key to candidate selection is staff involvement. In the city of Chula Vista, we are very involved in candidate selection. So we sit on the selection panel with the mayor staff. We review the applications prior to any nominations or interviews uh, taking place. And you need to review those applications for thoroughness and also to just make sure that they meet that um, threshold or criteria that's required to sit on a historic preservation commission. We believe in getting to know the candidates. So if they have sat on other city committees or commissions, reaching out to the staff that staffs those commissions and asking the questions that that applicant may not have thought to put down on their application. They may have strengths that they didn't even think applied um, to being a historic preservation commission. So sometimes references can assist with that. Those can be personal references or professional references. And then personal, personal interaction is really important. So we make sure that we pick up the phone when we receive an application. We reach out to the applicants, advise them that we have their application, that it's under review, and explain to them what the process will be. And I think that that assists some applicants from being less intimidated when they come into the interview process with staff. So interviews we have found are very important to glean a bit more information of your candidates. Uh, we do ask them if they have familiarity with our city historic preservation program. We have quite an elaborate program here in city of Chula Vista. Um, so we want to see if they've had an opportunity to familiarize themselves with that. We have established um, an established vision, goals and objectives that start from our general plan through our municipal code and down into our historic preservation program. So when we ask them what the importance of historic preservation is to them, we're looking to see if that aligns with the vision, goals, and objectives of our city and city program. We also ask them what they feel the role of a commissioner is and what the role of staff is, um, staff to a commission that is. So it's interesting because a lot of people know that they want to volunteer at the city. They um, don't really know that it entails being a public official that's beholden to legal requirements, um, legal ethics training and such. So sometimes they're not aware of that. So it's important that you bring that out early on so that they're aware of what it means to be a commissioner. And then we ask them to give us specific examples that they've had with problem solving and consensus. 
This is really important for any commission, any relationship that you might have. But more specifically to historic preservation commissions, I believe, is that historic preservation can be a political hot button community. And so we really want them to demonstrate to us that they have experience with problem solving in a situation that's not so cut and dry. And then why are they interested in being a historic preservation commissioner versus another city commissioner? And it's interesting because this question, the most basic of questions one would think, tended to stump some of the candidates. So they weren't quite sure how to answer that, but it wasn't a trick question. It was just what their interest was in being a historic preservation commissioner. We have a whole host of commissions here in the city. So just asking them that question. Commission training for a new commission and on an ongoing basis is so very important. Commission meeting protocols, um, making sure that your commissioners are informed and trained on the appropriate meeting protocols, what the role of the chairperson in a meeting is, what their role as a commissioner is on the dais, explaining to them that they are expected to be prepared and to participate effectively in meetings, to provide them an introduction and program overview early on, especially for new commissioners coming in that may not have ever sat on other city commissions, but specifically to the historic preservation program we have here in the city. So we provide them with a lot of information, we provide them with the historic preservation program document, ordinance, um, and other materials we find would be helpful for them in their role as a historic preservation commissioner. And we give that to them early on so that they're prepared when they come to their first meeting. It also gives them an opportunity to ask staff any questions prior to that first meeting. We go over a local history and what our periods of significance are within the city of Chula Vista and what resources have been determined to be important to our local history. And that's very important because those periods of significance oftentimes will be the basis for the decision that that commission will make. Again, going through the roles and responsibilities, really advising them what the role of staff is and what their expectation of staff um, it should be, and that we are a resource and a tool available to them, which they have quite a few uh, tools available to them, staff just being one of them. We are the technical advisor for the commission, but we also are a resource to guide them to find the answers for any questions they, they may have. So our attorney's office is also an invaluable resource to our commissioners. Our attorney's office here in the city of Chula Vista has an open door policy. All of our commissioners have a direct line number to our attorney's office. We can call at any time with any questions. Our attorney's office will provide advice to them, but ultimately it's up to the commissioner to decide whether or not to recuse themselves or whether or not they want to agree with the opinion the attorney's office. The same is the case with the FPPC. They are a great resource for any historic preservation commissioner. Um, we do have some commissioners that have asked the Fair Political Practices Commission to opine on some situations and the commission has done so and it has been invaluable to our commissioners. The National Alliance of Preservation Commissions has great resources online for commissioners as well as the State Historic Preservation Office. Potential issues that can arise in historic preservation commissions are brownout violations. And oftentimes, someone may not, not even realize that they have violated the Brown Act. And an example of that is with ex parte communication. We as staff, when we're communicating with our commissioners, we make it a point to not include the distribution list on that email correspondence so that if anyone replies to all, that they may not get caught up in something that may result in ex parte communication. Having communication with applicants is also something that can result in a Brown Act violation. Um, conflict of interest, as I mentioned, they have access to our city attorney's office as well as the FPPC so that they can ask if there's a situation that they want to confirm that they do not have a conflict of interest. And then advocate versus commissioner. We welcome advocates of historic preservation or any other advocates in city politics to participate on our historic preservation commission. But when they are doing so, when they are 
in that advocacy role that they make it very clear that they are not representing um, the city <laughs> in those areas. So it's important for the commissioners to recognize that they are city officials and that when they are doing something outside of that role as a city official that they make that clear they don't misrepresent themselves as a commissioner in that capacity and then trust as with any relationship trust is very key and we have found that when the commissioners trust staff and trust the professional opinion of staff and recognize that staff is not giving their personal opinion on a matter but ra rather substantiating that in professional um, experience and also findings of fact that the commission is required to make, we find that that breeds trust between the commissioners and staff. It's also important that the commissioners have trust amongst themselves. They're at the dais. They're working together. And again, in historic preservation, oftentimes you'll have situations that you need to problem solve and consensus build right there on the dais. So it's important that they trust one another. Keys to success, we found that clearly defining those roles and responsibilities that I've gone over previously, that of a commissioner, that of staff, that's a, that of an advocate, it's really important to define those roles early on and make sure that they know that they always have the um, ability to ask staff questions if they have any. To continue training, not just to train them up front, but to continue that training throughout have open lines of communication, the trust, and then community involvement. It's really important to keep the Historic Preservation Commission in the know with what's going on in the community, whether or not those items will come before them. So if it's an activity in the community, we will invite the commission to participate in that, to attend that, um, and then also to hold workshops with the community. So if there's a topic, that we feel that the commission needs to know about, we'll invite the public to participate in that. And that really helps to, again, breed that trust between the commission and the, the public. Uh, thank you, Lynette. And uh, your sound works great now. So thanks for adjusting your volume. Uh, Tim, we are set for you. Hopefully you uh, your sound is also still on. Yep, can you all still hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yep. OK, great. So uh, I am Tim Fry, the Preservation Coordinator uh, with the San Francisco Planning Department. And what I'm going to talk about is um, the specifics of uh, the San Francisco Historic Preservation Commission, and in particular, um, some of the changes that we had um, over the last couple years and some of the policies and um, uh, important pieces of the Historic Preservation Commission work plan um, that we put together in the last few years. And you know, by no means are these like the only policies or um, the only pressing matters that confront commissions, but these are um, more about what was confronting our commission and, and uh, issues that they felt they needed to deal with right away or we're still currently walking or working through um, their development. Um, let me see if I have control over my PowerPoint. Uh, John, can you advance my slides for me? Yes, I can. Thanks. Thank you. So again, uh, just going to give a quick overview of our Historic Preservation Commission and preservation planning in San Francisco. Briefly talk about the RHPC powers and duties um, the seats associated with our commission, much like what Lynette had just described, and then get into a little more detail about, again, how the commission developed its own work pl uh, plan, how it built relationships with other commissions, the broader public and, and, and planning department staff, and then a couple examples of the policies and goals that they set out for themselves uh, in building those relationships and work plans. So uh, from this slide, you know, the Historic Preservation Commission is a relatively new thing for San Francisco. Uh, beginning in 1967, San Francisco had a, an, an advisory board that advised not only planning staff but our planning commission. But that advisory board was dissolved in 2008 as part of a, um, uh, a charter amendment 
um, that the voters approved dissolving the Landmarks Board and creating a full-fledged Historic Preservation Commission with um, oversight and binding decision-making um, uh, authority over entitlements and any recommendations for landmark designation uh, to our Board of Supervisors, which is essentially our City Council. Uh, they still provide um, services as an advisory body in some capacities and as an action body in others. And our designating ordinances or our enabling legislation is um, within our planning code and um, that's what in the last red box there you see it says all Article 10 and 11 properties. Articles 10 and 11 are the parts of our planning code that protect uh, historic buildings. Article 10 is citywide, um, but Article 11 is specific to our conservation districts that are in the um, downtown areas and primarily in the financial districts. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So again, uh, much like Lynette described, um, our commission is a seven-member body of professionals that all have to meet the Secretary of Interior standards, our Secretary of Interior's professional qualification standards. Uh, they're all uh, mayor appointed with, but they require Board of Supervisor approval. And uh, our seats one through six are, um, you know, our preservation professionals. Uh, and for example, you know, here I put sort of a, a list of the types of preservation professionals that are um, eligible to sit on our commission, but they are assigned specific seats. For instance, seats one and two. Um, must be licensed architects. However, C5 is a historic preservation professional and in our charter it gives some flexibility on what that means where we could have a preservation professional associated with law or land use, community planning, etc. Um, C6 must be a contractor, an engineer, or a materials conservator. And again, you know, the these appointments have to demonstrate compliance with our city charter and that they fulfill the requirements of those seats. Our last seat is generally, I put here, member of the public, just for lack of a better word of describing sort of an at-large seat. Um, our current at-large seat is, is, is um, occupied by, I would say, a preservation professional, but they have a much different um, sort of cachet of experience that would not fit them in seats one through six, but it, it, the, the way the charter is laid out is meant to be um, essentially a member of a community or a non-preservation professional that can provide sort of a different aspect or perspective to decision making on the commission, which I think is, depending on how your commission is set up, is a really important piece. And Wade talked about that a little bit in, um, the, with the youth summit and the types of folks that, um, you know, display interest in participating on a commission, sometimes, you know, the most effective and the most um, dedicated um, commission members may not be have or meet the professional qualification standards, but they certainly can provide the level of attention to detail and consideration for preservation issues. and. Uh, um, it's important to have that flexibility in your charter or whatever your 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 governing ordinances or um, for your commission to allow for the public to have an active role um, on your commission. And John, can we go to the next slide? And again, here's just a <coughs> excuse me a breakdown of the role our commission plays. They're an action body for those entitlements like certificates of appropriateness. Um, or uh, other building associated or development entitlements for landmark buildings. They also adopt uh, our methodology and our finding for all our surveys and our contact statements. Um, and then as an advisory capacity, which you know some would argue even in an advisory capacity, this is one of their most important roles, is forwarding landmark designations or recommendations for landmark designations in districts to the Board of Supervisors. Um, it, with the previous landmarks board, there were a lot of um, other steps uh, to fulfill than just having the Landmarks Board initiate a designation. Uh, the difference is um, with the, the HPC is, you know, the, the designation sort of lives and dies with our commission. They, if they decide to move something forward, it moves forward. But if 
they're not interested or they don't think a certain property meets the criteria, um, it, it will end there with their vote. Where the Landmarks Advisory Board previously, again, the Landmarks Board was providing advice, but the Planning Commission, the Department, the Board of Supervisors all could weigh in and still decide to move forward with a designation despite the Landmarks Board's vote on, on that proposed designation. Our commission also has a role in CEQA review. They provide review and comment on our draft EIRs. They sort of operate like a, a, a member of the public. They're not required to provide review and comment, but it just makes sense for us. Um, when uh, the documents are submitted for public cir circulation, we schedule a hearing at the HPC. The HPC basically writes a letter to our environmental review officer and uh, you know, states whether or not they think the preservation alternatives are appropriate, whether um, the level of analysis is appropriate, and it certainly helps us um, provide a much more um, well-rounded document once the EIR moves forward for certification. Um, legislative review, again, any um, proposed legislation, whether it's initiated at the board or, you know, through some other mechanism, if it affects historic resources in some way. Um, they don't even have to be designated resources, but if it affects um, the, you know, our existing or potential historic resources, uh, the commission will weigh in on that legislation as, as sort of our, 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 our experts on preservation in the city. And again, that's just to provide advice to the decision makers, the Board of Supervisors. On any ways, the, the legislation may be fine-tuned or improved to help promote historic resources, protect them, provide incentives, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> and um, after describing all this, I just thought it would be helpful to get an, an understanding of really the areas of the city I'm talking about. Some folks perceive San Francisco naturally as a very old city um, from you know West Coast standards, but um, with a lot of intact um, uh, uh, um, historic fabric, but our designating ordinances under Articles 10 and 11 um, only protect about one, one and a half percent of the city. We have 265 individual landmarks and 13 landmark districts. The blue areas are our conservation districts, which we have six conservation districts within our downtown core. Uh, San Francisco is still a very dense city, so this does, you know, constitutes still thousands and thousands of buildings under the purview of our commission. Um, but again, just to give some, a little more perspective, these are the only areas of the city that are um, regulated under or ha where the Historic Preservation Commission has purview. I know, and maybe some of you have experienced this before, is you know, some folks think if you establish a Historic Preservation Commission, even at an advisory board level, that somehow you know, all development is going to freeze in time. Uh, and, um, you know, we were able to show or to demonstrate that, you know, our commission has a very specific um, agenda in mind and has limitations to what they can and can't do. And, you know, certainly those decisions are not going to be um, uh, taken lightly, but they're also not going to uh, be done in a haphazard way that somehow going to thwart development or um, impede the natural progression of whether you need additional housing, um, you know, improved public spaces, et cetera. Um, so the commission, in dealing with that, you know, sort of set out on its initial days on how, how it could improve its relationship or basically the PR for the commission um, and get more interaction not only with the public but department staff, other city agencies, and other commissions um, within the city. Can we go to the next slide? So again, uh, it's all about relationships. You know, the, our Historic Preservation Commission is developed in 2009. Their, their mayor appoints some folks. Uh, they're all seated. And what we found was there was a, a lot of um, concern about really what was the role of the commission. We already had a planning commission. We have a planning department with you know 200 planners that review projects on a regular basis. How was the commission going to fit into this? And again, it was all about relationships. And so 
us along with our commission, the commission knew, you know, you know, they could rely on staff to go out there and pound the pavement and and start developing these connections that they needed, but they had to do it themselves. So our commissioners, you know, talked to the folks they knew and we started um, interacting with other commissions and decision-making bodies, offering those commissions to come present at our HPC hearing. We presented to those commissions um, about sort of what the HPC was. We weren't really doing anything in those first, you know, those first few days, so we were able to just show them, you know, this is what our the city charter requires the commission to do, this is what we hope to do, and certainly it helped smooth things along and show people that we were there and we were listening and the commission was interested in working with folks. Uh, another way to do that was through um, joint commission hearings. Sometimes our planning commission will have to approve an entitlement that our historic preservation commission will be involved in as well. Maybe there's a C of A certificate of appropriateness associated with like a, a, a land use entitlement, like conditional use. We can have joint commission hearings. The commission can also have joint hearings with our rec park commission, um, the Department of Building Inspection commission, the Mayor's Office on Disabilities commission. Um, so it gave it, it. It was an opportunity to sh also show that the commission doesn't necessarily want to make decisions in a bubble. They want to hear from other decision-making bodies and make a you know a, a, a decision that addresses all city policies and priorities in a holistic manner. Departmental meetings. We again invited a lot of folks. John, can we go back one slide, please? Uh, departmental meetings and presentations, again, not only inviting the commissions, but inviting their staff to present and also for us to present um, projects that we're working on and, and, um, and what we had in our own pipeline. And again, looking for opportunities to how we can get not only the commissions working together, but sometimes just department staff. You know, some city agencies, you know, culturally have a very different set of priorities than another department, whether it's Department of Public Works or MTA um, or, you know, Rec Park, um, and we were able to work together, show, hey, this is in our pipeline, maybe there's opportunities for us to connect. <coughs> and again, not only looking for those broader connections, but also looking how historic preservation can fit within the dialogue to ultimately not only result in a better project, but hopefully one that um, that preserves more of whatever resource is involved in that project as well. One of the great tools that we used to um, help sort of just gather our thoughts was outlining um, goals within the CLG annual report. You know, as you know, as the CLG, when we all prepare these reports at the end of the year, one of the things we do is we bring the draft report to our commission and we list some goals of what we want to accomplish in the next year. And it was a great way for the commission just to sort of look back on what they've done, look back at what the department's done, and really figure out what they could um, think about for the, the, the future ahead. And then the cross-agency policy development, again, this was talking about you know, those, those interactions and those relationships on various projects, and especially when you have two very culturally different um, departments or you know, departments with different goals or different priorities or another, you know, a commission that has different priorities. So let's say, you know, Department of Public Works is, you know, wants to widen the streets in a historic district. Naturally, there's going to be a CEQA component to that, but how can our commission, Department of Public Works and the planning department work with, with that, work with everyone to achieve a, a sort of a roadmap on how we're going to review a project um, how decisions are going to be made, especially when we have conflicting policies. Um, and again, it's more of an internal document, but I think it's these sorts of documents have helped a lot in sort of smoothing out the feathers and, and getting folks to understand and departments to understand that, you know, we, we know that historic preservation is just one step in a much larger process, but if we can engage everyone early and quickly, then we can sort of achieve, hopefully, one of the better um, possible outcomes for a project. 
And then finally, uh, commission outreach and accessibility. The commission, you know, as Lynette mentioned, felt it was really important to make sure the public knew that they were accessible whenever they needed them. So we often bring commissioners to community meetings, again, not to violate the Brown Act, or be mindful not to evaluate uh, the Brown Act or any ex parte communication issues, um, but show that the commission's there, they're listening, and that they're interested in what the community um, you know, has to offer or feels is important from a preservation standpoint. Uh, next slide, please. And so the, my two last slides, I was just going to go through a couple of the, the, the elements of the RHPC's work program over the last few years and, and, and um, some elements that they felt were important um, to address right away. And again, these may not be applicable to every commission, but I think they're, they were a good reminder, at least to me, on sort of where our commission is today after you know five or so years of being around. So the, one of the first things they did was revive the preservation element. As a CLG, you know, we're all required to have some sort of preservation component to our general plan. For the last 45 years or so, we've had various preservation policies sort of peppered throughout the entire plan. There was some discussion in the 80s and 90s about developing a separate preservation element, which I know many other cities in California have done, and the commission felt it was really important to dust that off and to uh, consolidate sort of the preservation goals for the city in one, in one place. So we're currently working through this. We have a draft document, and we've been doing a lot of outreach um, with the public and uh, various stakeholders. So again, just it kind of just makes sense, you know, you know, to have a commission, you also need to have a vision. And sometimes the city charter can be a bit vague on what that vision should be. So the preservation element is certainly going to help us um, form some, some policies or at least a roadmap so people understand how the city is going to look at historic preservation issues and a much broader perspective with all the other priorities and policies of the city. The commission regularly reviews its rules and regulations, and this can go, um, you know, this is everything from, you know, standard parliamentary procedure to, you know, what types of drawings do they want to see for certain types of projects. One of the things that they just developed, um, which we're really excited about, is the rules and regs still tend to be a fairly, I don't know, bureaucratic and sort of technical document. And they wanted something that the, the public would really be able to understand. Uh, and so we've also created a How to Succeed at the Commission handout, which basically just outlines you know, how, to, how to give convincing public comment at, at a hearing. Like, here's, here's how you get your points across. It's sort of like a public speaking 101 at, when you're in a hearing format. Um, and then it also includes some information about, you know, this is what you need to give the commission so they have everything in front of them to make their decision. Uh, we're uh, rolling these documents out in the next couple months, and they'll be on our website. The commission also, like, as I think any commission, was concerned about ex parte communication, and it has evaluated a variety of options for, you know, the pros and cons of that. You know, should plan planning staff be there, does planning staff have to be there, certainly they have to disclose it, disclose these, you know, discussions or meetings and how would they do that. And they looked at everything from, you know, no communication with the public at all to, you know, a fairly liberal policy. Um, they haven't really decided what they're going to do, but they do, you know, um, uh, are in terms of adopting a formal policy, but they do, uh, they did agree to just essentially disclose everything at a hearing before an item to make sure the public understands if there have been any discussions outside of the hearing. Our d designating ordinance is, um, or our enabling ordinance is very is vague on what criteria we use to designate a property or could use. And so one of the first things the commission did was they um, uh, issued their own policy on what types of criteria they would be considering when a landmark or potential landmark comes over, um, comes across their desk. And this was an important thing to them because we evaluated the whole designation program for the last 45 years and came up with some recommendations. And then the commission 
was able to say, okay, you know, this is an area where we feel there's a need. This neighborhood doesn't have any landmarks. Certainly there's got to be something important there. Planning department, go talk to this neighborhood and figure out, you know, what's important there and if there's some, you know, political um, buy-in to move a, a, any sort of designation forward. So um, that was helpful. They also realized, you know, we're, we're lacking in modern resource designation. So the commission just added as a priority anytime a modern resource is proposed for la landmark designation, that designation should be prioritized above, above others. So <laughs> that was helpful not only in giving the public direction on what the commission wanted to see, but also giving planning staff direction on what we should prioritize in our work. And along with that, they developed a work program. Um, our work program for landmark designation for the last 45 years has basically just been a list of properties the commission or the public would ideally like to see protected um, through local designation. They formalized that program and uh, we revisit it on a, basically a quarterly basis now and they determine if something should be prioritized over another, maybe because it's threatened mm -hmm. or there's, um, you know, there's a groundswell of public interest in a particular property. That enables the commission to, to modify its work program on a quarterly basis and tell staff what we, they think we should be working on. Uh, another big piece was administrative review. Um, are the way our uh, enabling ordinance is, is laid out is the commission has to essentially review every building permit associated with a landmark property. We were able to come up with a delegation program where almost 70% of permits and entitlements now are delegated to staff at for administrative approval, and the commission is now really just seeing what they really care about, which tend to be the larger projects anyway, or the projects that could have a potential to, um, um, or not potential to impact the, the resource, but at least um, require a lot more explanation on how the project may or may not comply with the standards. Those are the, the, the types of projects they wanted to see, and so we were able to make uh, a very or develop a very clear program not only for the public but for us on on how to move those forward and the I, the nice thing about this is with our with our program there is still an opportunity for the public to basically request a hearing on anything staff has approved if they feel like we've acted inappropriately and so there was some trust issues with the public but I think we were able to remedy that and and to date we have only had one request for hearing. Um, in the last five years out of the hundreds of, of, of entitlements that we've approved at the staff level. Uh, next slide. And it, these will be fairly quick. Uh, the commission wanted to develop a policy on ADA um, review and barrier removal, especially when the mayor's office on dis disability is involved because it's a city-owned property. Uh, the, this is sort of like the MOA I was talking about. Again, it's more of a policy about they laid out when the commission will review it, how they'll work with the mayor's office on disability, and again, it was just a way to provide some clarity to the process rather than bouncing or ping-ponging an applicant between two commissions that may not necessarily see eye to eye. We're currently developing preservation design guidelines. Um, those will be adopted by both our Historic Preservation Commission but our Planning Commission, and those are currently in development. Uh, EIR preservation alternatives. This was an interesting one. The, the commission over the past few years has been sometimes disappointed in the level of pres uh, the level of development for preservation alternatives in EIRs, and uh, they're currently developing a policy. It, I'm hoping it'll be adopted next month on exactly what they expect to see in a preservation alternative and the types of preservation alternatives that are common and for EIRs that may have a potential impact on a historic resource. And this is going to be a great tool for us at the staff level because we're able to show the applicants up front of what they can expect to see at an HPC hearing. Even though the commission's only providing review and comment, it, it you know, their, their review and comment could potentially impact those schedules. Um, for EIR and entitlement approval, and they need to understand that, you know, when we're asking for alternatives, you know, it's not that we're being arbitrary about it. 
um, that there is a real reason. And so I'm hoping this policy will help clarify that for, for applicants. <laughs> and then finally, the, on the right-hand side, these are just a couple things that, um, again, DLG annual report is a great way to revisit or set goals every year. Um, our commission also re reviews the draft budget um, for the department, but also for our, our historic preservation division. Um, and they always provide great comments on, you know, ways we can help Im um, improve um, our process, but also, you know, if they feel we really need another person to work on landmark designations or, or in preservation entitlements, they can provide that comment, and then those comments go to our Board of Supervisors and the Mayor to consider as part of budget development. And then finally, something that our commission just did, which is um, slightly tied to what Wade was talking about, is um, you know there's this growing interest in cultural and social heritage, but it doesn't always fit well within our traditional construct of how we designate properties at the local level and how the how cities regulate them through permanent entitlement process. So our commission's um, our president just appointed a cultural heritage assets committee who uh, this committee now is reading, uh, meeting on a regular basis to come up with some recommendations on how the city can help support um, you know, these efforts to protect and promote resources, which as you know sometimes are intangible resources like uh, the Cherry Blossom Festival in Japantown or uh, the, you know, the, the Gay Pride Parade or, you know, it, or it could be tangible, you know, it's a 1906 building, but there is a Filipino grocery store in that building that's significant for how it's contributed to the community from, um, you know, from the 1970s. We're sort of grappling with some of these issues or these tricky pieces of preservation right now, and we're hoping this committee will give us some solid recommendations on how the city can move forward um, with helping the community protect those types of resources. So I believe that's it for my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, um, if any of you have um, examples of certain policies your commission has dealt as, um, you know, I know that every every city is different and is always um, tackling uh, different types of issues. So thank you. Um, thank you, thank you all. And I don't know if I briefly lost connection for whatever reason, but I think we're we're just about to hit the Q and A period. I noticed that there's some poll responses. Um, it looks like about half say no and half say don't know. So that's kind of interesting as far as um, none of these uh, attendees have a city that um, definitely allows members under the age of 18, as far as they know. Um, I did have a few questions roll, and it looks like most of these questions would apply to each of the three of you or all three of you. So uh, maybe I'll start with the first question that you'll probably see in the Q&A box. Uh, and the question is coming from Anaheim. They were asking if any uh, prisoners have ever worked um, with community unofficial historic preservation committees. And if so, what kind of role did those committee members play? Um. Yeah, this is Wade. I, could, I forgot to mention that in my presentation, but our ordinance was actually created in part with uh, lobbying from kind of our citywide nonprofit, which <clears throat> was created, um, basically the, a nonprofit was created to advocate for preservation in our city, and then 
one of their first goals was to create a preservation commission, and one of those people got on city council, um, and then they continued to basically raise money. Our city is kind of a West Belt city, doesn't have a lot of extra budget, so they would continue to raise money to support preservation activities for the city, and then they would put in, um, they would give money to the city to provide match for um, preservation study grants. And we work with, this is Tim, we work with um, a variety of different community groups, and uh, there are a couple community groups that have sort of their own formalized historic preservation committee for that neighborhood or group, and um, you know, often they will provide comment on a project that affects them to our commission, um, but what we often do with them is if they ask us to provide assistance from a, as almost like a technical advisor, we will attend their meeting sometimes. Um, if they ask us if there's a more complex project where they need technical assistance and we'll help sort of walk them through what the city requirements are, what the Historic Preservation Commission requirements are. Um, but it's, again, it's more sort of an as-needed basis. We, we only go when we're invited, um, but I would say it happens usually a couple times a year. Um, and certainly our commission takes their comments very seriously as you know, they're sort of the eyes and ears in those neighborhoods or in those communities on, on what's happening to historic resources. So if they weigh in on a project a certain way, they will take that very seriously in, under their own deliberation. And in Chula Vista, we worked with an ad hoc historic preservation advisory committee um, through the development of our ordinance and program. And that committee was comprised members of the realty group that I spoke about, developers, uh, historic preservation um, stakeholders here in, in the community. And they really did a lot of work to help us develop our, our historic preservation program. And a couple of them actually sit on our commissioner, on our commission as commissioners. Great. Thank you each for uh, chiming in on that. And I have another question. And actually, this question is um, interrelated with our first part of this three-part series. It's mainly about certified local governments. But the question is actually about um, different jurisdictions and forming joint powers agreements. And the reason I'm sort of bringing this up is uh, if, if um, commissions uh, or if you're aware of um, uh, different jurisdictions working together from different commissions. And I guess certain resources could fall within different jurisdictions, like I'm thinking of the Golden Gate Bridge or um, a number of different uh, resources that would fall between borders of either the county and the city. And how would how would uh, commissions be involved in that and, and what, what sort of um, cross-department or cross-committee sort of work would be done in that case? So in Chula Vista, we actually are involved in a joint exercise powers agreement, not a JPA, but a GEPA for our Otai Valley Regional Park. And that's a historic park, uh, not designated, but it has ties to Native American history and the such. That park's managed um, in cooperation with three different agencies. So the County of San Diego, the City of San Diego, and then the City of Chula Vista. It's managed with somewhat a MOU, if you will. So it's a contractual agreement that we participate and we pay our proportional share to manage and operate it. And then it has its own advisory committee. And, um, and then we have decision makers, one representative from each of our council, board of supervisor, and um, city of San Diego council members that sit on it as a policy committee. So we manage it cooperatively. It's not specifically a historical resource in terms of being designated, but it is an asset that we all manage, and, and that's how we do that. And this, this is Tim. We have a, an MOA with the Port Authority. And, you know, as most of the port property, especially along the Embarcadero, is not only part of a listed National Register district, we have a number of those properties, like the Ferry Building, um, that are locally designated, even though they're not under the city's jurisdiction. So the MOA um, allows 
us to work with the port and have a clear sort of roadmap on how our commission is going to interact with the port commission and port staff on any projects that um, could affect those resources. So um, what had been done in the past is the planning department had basically budgeted or paid for a preservation planner at the port. Um, that now has, has changed, and now the port funds its own preservation planners. Um, but we work very closely with them. So for instance, even though a certificate of appropriateness may not be required for work on the ferry building, um, sort of as a matter of courtesy and sort of informational um, um, process, the, 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 the port will bring the, a, basically a compliance with the Secretary of Interior standards for work on the ferry building to our Historic Preservation Commission. It's not necessarily a binding decision, but you know, again, because of the relationships we've built and the way we collaborate in an, in an active manner on these projects, um, because we both have an interest in the fact that they're in San Francisco, um, you know, the commission can say, well, you know, we think X should happen to this project to make it um, compliant with the standards. Uh, the, you know, the Port Authority takes that very seriously. And if there's an issue like that, we generally can work it out beforehand. Um, but again, it's more about us just staying connected and involved with what one another is doing so we can make sure that both of our commissions are knowledgeable and are able to answer questions or deal with issues should they arise in another form outside of their commission hearing. OK. Uh, Wade, do you have anything on that? Nope, nothing else. All right. Um, I, guess, uh, I guess a few quick questions that I thought of, actually, um, since I don't see any others come in. We still have about five minutes here. Um, I was wondering how common paid positions are on commissions. I know they're pretty common on the East Coast, um, but they don't seem too common out here out West. This is Tim. None our commission our receives us. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Lynette. No, I was just saying none of our city commissioners are, are paid. We did have one body here in the city of Chula Vista that was a redevelopment, an arm of our redevelopment agency that was a position, but that didn't work out <laughs> since since disbanded. Prior to redevelopment disbanding, it actually disbanded. And this is Tim. Our commission receives a small stipend for every meeting they attend, but it's a it's very small. Most of the commissioners, from my understanding, either donate it to a local preservation organization. Um, or, or, or do something else with it because it's so small. Um, but my understanding is n not all commissions in San Francisco um, are, are paid, meaning that they receive a stipend. But, um, but our commissions, both the Planning Commission and HPC, receive some small, small gesture. Okay. Same thing in Colorado. I think state statute says they shall serve unpaid and Pueblo actually paid them. So I think in a strange way, they were breaking the law by <laughs> paying their, um, for the Planning and Zoning Commission. And, and the Historic Preservation Commission is kind of not a black sheep, and we kind of did a good job of getting it up to speed. But they didn't receive any stipend for their work. And what, what, what I mean, quickly, what is the typical term that commissioners serve in, in, your, um, in your cities? In Chula Vista, they serve two four-year terms. Uh, four-year terms. Oh. This is Tim. Our, our commissioners can serve in, indefinitely as long as they're reappointed by the mayor and approved by the board. Uh, but generally, they're four-year terms. And then every year, or at each of those four-year intervals, they have to be reappointed. I think that's an important point, Tim. I, um, term limits, I mean, different people have different perspective on those, but sometimes it's hard to find good people for a preservation commission. And mm -hmm. as long as they have a term that's constantly expiring, having a term limit that they couldn't come back is actually kind of problematic for us. We had a couple of good people that ran into being term limited out that still wanted to serve that um, were doing a great job. So I think they, they shouldn't be term limited out even though they should have terms. 
Yeah, and our biggest challenge is, you know, and I know other cities have this requirement, is you have to live within the city and county of San Francisco to be appointed to any of our commissions, and it just makes it very difficult to um, uh, develop a diverse um, uh, commission, not only from perspectives and educational background, but all other types of experiences and background if you're sort of fairly limited in your, your geography and you're always having to look for new folks every few years. Great. I wanted I, to... I think yeah. Go ahead. Oh, just one more point. I think in, in Colorado, some of the smaller cities, um, I think they allow people to have other um, levels of... Um, People on the Preservation Commission, the experts that are from outside the city, obviously like non-voting members, but small cities have a hard time finding that professional capacity to be a CLG. So I think there are couples that allow people from you know neighboring cities, professionals, to, to serve at some capacity on the commission. Hmm. Okay, great. Well, we're uh, right on 129. I told people that we would be on time today, and by God, we were. And thank you all for um, keeping on time. I really appreciate each each of your um, time and commitment, and and also the registrants who, um, by by your registration fees, you're supporting uh, uh, the California Preservation Foundation so that we can advocate for the protection of historic places across the state. What I'm going to do right now, I'm I'm showing a screen with a survey, and I'm going to ask um, all of you as soon as it pops up to um, answer these multiple choice questions in the survey. Um, this allows us to improve the programs. Um, you, get, you have an opportunity to let us know what you want in the program, um, especially on the written portions on the right-hand side. Uh, you'll see that there's an additional comments field. You can type any comments about today's session there. On the top, there's a suggested, suggested topics field. You can type in any suggested topics for future workshops. Um, forgive the links at the top. I didn't realize those were older links, but uh, what I will do is email um, each of you by the end of the day the PDF of the PowerPoint presentations and also um, a link to any additional resources um, that we that we identify here from this presentation. So um, please do respond to the response and, and at the top of the page there's a button that says re submit response. You need to press the top of the page, the button at the top. Um, to make sure that the uh, responses go through. So thanks again for your, for your time, and I apologize for the technical issues today, but um, all in all, we're right on time. So, oh, I also wanted to give a special word of thanks to the um, NAPC, who, um, with Wade's help and, and donated time, as well as the um, cities of San Francisco and Chula Vista, um, for, their, for their involvement today. Um, uh, it's a wonderful partnership to be working with the NAPC, and uh, I hope to work with them more. So thanks again, um, and have a wonderful day.